All right, this is the... This is Western Civ II, and this is our first lecture here. This is, uh, I start Western Civ II with World War I. And um, World War I, you have to actually know a date for it. You actually have to know 1914, and uh, the fighting stops in 1918. So these are dates you actually have to know. You have to know a few dates in history. This is one. World War I is a terrible war. I uh, use this picture here. This is a recruiting poster, a French recruiting poster, trying to get young Frenchmen to sign up for the war. This would have been in the middle of the war. The poster's not hiding anything. It is a pretty nasty war. Fought the Western Front, fought in France, and the Eastern Front, front fought over between Germans and the Russians. World War I is called the Great War. And the reason it's called this is because World War II hasn't happened yet. And when World War II comes along, we'll start calling this one World War I. At the time, it's called the Great War, the greatest war ever fought, or the worst war ever fought. Um, the idea, the... Some people call it the war to end all wars, that once this is over, humans will never fight another war, that once they experience World War I, they'll never fight again. Millions of soldiers were killed or maimed. This has never been experienced on this kind of a level anyway in Europe, maybe over somewhere in Asia, but never in Europe like this. Millions of soldiers dead or maimed. Those that survived, they used the term the lost generation. Ernest Hemingway used the term the lost generation because even if you survive, there's something wrong with you that you're missing all your friends or part of, part of your body or part of your brain is missing. It's just terrible, if you, even if you survived. In the end, four empires come down. Those empires being the Russian Empire, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, all come crashing down. So once the war's over in 1918, it's not really over yet for those areas because chaos ensues. Without a government, all these empires are going to be uh, clashing with each other, the people in the empires. The big question of World War I is how did it start? You can read a book on World War I itself, and it's not exactly great entertainment, but uh, the great history questions come up with how it started in the first place. Uh, half of a book on World War I will be simply how it started in the first place. The answer is it starts with a rivalry between France, which was a powerful empire, and a growing new state called Germany. The first time they come into conflict, conflict is in 1870. France was a powerful empire, and a small German state, or actually a large German state, called Prussia are going to go to war. It's called the Franco-Prussian War, 1870. And there's another date you need to know, 1870, and then it'll lead to World War I in 1914. So let's go back to 1870. What's happening in France is France has an emperor. France has an empire in 1870. The emperor's name is Napoleon III. Perhaps you've heard the name Napoleon before, I hope. This is Napoleon III. He is the nephew of the great Napoleon, the Napoleon who conquered all of Europe and was defeated at Waterloo. This is his nephew. Um, he was elected president first on his name, and then he became emperor. He is setting about building a great French empire. You know, his, nep his uncle had conquered all of Europe, and here's the nephew wanting to also conquer, but not in Europe. You know, Europeans would have trouble with that, so he's conquering outside of Europe. He's building a great French empire around the world, trying to catch up with the English. The English have a great, British have a great empire around the world, and now this is France's time to catch up. Meanwhile, in Europe, he is the champion of nations. He is claiming that in Europe, there are people all around who need their own nations. When you look at the Russian Empire, or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or the Ottoman Empire, that there's people there who are being oppressed, and they need their own nations. But that's within Europe. So outside the world, he's conquering people. Inside of Europe, he wants to liberate people. It's kind of a strange situation. He's a very strange emperor. Um, the thing that he fears most are these German states. He recognized that these German states ever get together, and it's right on the French border. If they ever get together, France could be in trouble. And so he's actually going to be proven right in this. So here's a map showing France, giant country of France. And then in the middle of Europe are these German states, what used to be the Holy Roman Empire, Napoleon I had gotten rid of the Holy Roman Empire, and now it's a collection of German states. Here's a map showing some of them. Basically the heart of Europe. These are really powerful in uh, area here, but they're not united. All these German people speak German, but they're not united as a country just yet. Looking at these German states, what's happening there is they have a confederation, a German confederation. They're not Germany in 1870. They're a confederation led by Prussia, a confederation is inherently weak. The people are part of it, but they don't have to do anything much. But Prussia dominates. They've been, Prussia's been dominating since the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. 
Prussia's capital is Berlin. You need to know this because it'll eventually be the capital of Germany, Berlin, powerful city. The Germans will have defensive treaties with each other. So they're united in a confederation, which is weak, but they unite if someone's attacked. If one of them is attacked, then they will come to the aid of any Germans that are being attacked. This is important. It's not an offensive treaty. You can't be offensive, but if you're attacked, the other Germans will come to your rescue. The, let's just look at the state of Prussia because the war is coming between France and Prussia. Prussia has a king. There are other German kings, but Prussia has a king named William I, or Wilhelm, his German name Wilhelm, and, but we'll call him William. And then he also has a prime minister. The king is there for ceremony mostly, and then he has a prime minister, in this case a genius of a prime minister named Otto von Bismarck. If you'll notice the von in the name here indicates that he is of nobility. He is a deep conservative. He wants the nobility to rule, but he does want a German state. He will dedicate himself to building a German state, and he does it through seeking war. Again, a war to unite the Germans, and his victim is going to be France. Unite the Germans by going to war against France. So here's the pictures of them. There's the King William I, or Wilhelm, and here's Otto von Bismarck, the eventual creator of Germany. So here's those German states again. A lot of area, very powerful, on the French border. So the event comes along in 1870 is what's going to happen here. What happened in 1870 was that the throne of Spain was vacant. Spain was a powerful kingdom back a couple hundred years ago. By 1870, this is a pretty weak place. The place is falling apart. And so the throne of Spain comes open, and it's not like everyone wants to be the king of Spain. So they have to shop around, and they eventually will settle on a Hohenzollern. This is the royal family of Prussia. The Prussia seems to be rising and powerful, and so the Spanish would, would like to be connected to this powerful German family. So they send an offer out to maybe a cousin. Maybe the Prussian king could have a cousin who would want to be the king of Spain. And uh, when France finds out about this, France goes ballistic, that they're already starting to fear the German states, and now a Hohenzollern, a Prussian, would be on the throne of Spain to the south of France. And so France demands, sends a demand that Prussia forfeit, <laughs> the Hohenzollern family forfeit this attempt to be king of Spain, or else it's going to be war. Spain, France will not tolerate having a potential enemy to the east and a potential enemy to the south. And William agreed, the king of Prussia agreed that this would be bad for France, and so he sent his, uh, let it be known that his cousin would not take the throne. Well, this didn't go far enough. France, you know, fired up for war. Uh, you know, the French could get very, very fired up. Uh, demand further terms. The emperor Napoleon III gets involved now and wants further terms. He wants the king of Prussia to sign a document never to put a Hohenzollern on the throne of Spain, and he sends his ambassador to meet with the king. Actually, there's, he's going to confront him, more of a meeting, less of a meeting and more of a confrontation. It takes place at Ems, and this is a spa, a German spa, where the king would go and take the baths, and they believe that this was a healing process. And so he's out walking one day, and this French ambassador comes up and with a piece of paper and demands that he sign it, and he refused. He refused to sign this document that... Uh, his word was good enough that a Hohenzollern would not sit on the throne. So the meeting was rather innocuous. However, the king sends a telegram to his prime minister. It's called the famous Ems telegram, the king's telegram from Ems, informing Bismarck of what had happened there. And uh, Bismarck is going to edit it. He's going to take the long telegram that the king sent, edit it down, change the words a little bit, and then release it to the press. And he knew what he was doing. He knew that the way that he had edited this would be an insult to France and an insult to Prussia. Both sides would be insulted. In fact, he was correct. There's going to be outrage in Paris and Berlin when they get this edited telegram. By the way, Bismarck knew what he was doing. We have one of his letters to a friend just after this saying, I'm waving a red flag in front of a, a French bull. This is going to lead to war. And he knew it. He has the Prussian military ready. He was planning this. For years, Bismarck has been working on the Prussian military, perfecting it, and uh, getting the Germans to go along with him. And so the Prussian military is ready for war, which he is creating. This is the Franco-Prussian War. As he predicted, France declared war on the state of Prussia, a empire declaring war on a German state. If you were alive at the time, France would be the bad guy here. So French armies will come rushing toward the German border, heading for Berlin with chance of on to Berlin, they're advancing to the Rhine. They're setting foot now in German territory. And as they do, the German armies, led by Prussia, 
come sweeping into France. The Germans were ready, the French were not for what was happening here. In fact, the two French armies heading toward the German border will just simply be surrounded and within months they will be surrendering to the Germans. The two surrenders are at Metz and Sedan. You don't need to know these two for the test. I'm not going to ask you where they surrendered, but uh, it couldn't hurt to know that these, it's a humiliation for France. Right along the German border here, two French armies are just, un, just not annihilated, just surrender. They're poorly led, poorly supplied, and they just surrender. Here's a picture of one of the battles here. You've got the French you're still using cavalry in 1870. You get these German soldiers here with their, their new uh, breech-loading rifles. That, would, that was new at the time. Uh, Napoleon III actually rode into battle, trying to be like his uncle and trying to be great, and uh, was captured. Here's a picture of him sitting with Bismarck. After he was captured by the Germans, he will eventually, he will not be allowed back in France, and he'll go settle in England. Uh, but Fr France is no longer an empire anymore. They, the emperor is gone. Bismarck will go on to be the great hero of Germany. The war continues, uh, the German armies will continue on to Paris and lay siege to Paris. In 1870, in the later months here, uh, German troops will surround Paris. And something interesting here is that Paris actually creates a new government. They have no government, the emperor is gone, and so the city of Paris creates a revolutionary government by itself. It's called the Paris Commune. You see the word commune there. This is the first establishment of a communist government. Karl Marx, we'll talk about later, has published a book about this, and here are the people of Paris creating a communist government for their city. Bismarck, with Paris under siege, decides we need to get out of here. And you know, they're deep into France now, and so the Germans need to get out of this. And Bismarck will make peace not with Paris, Paris will not make peace, but with the outside government, the government of France outside of Paris. Here's what he wants, he wants an indemnity. This is a common thing in war. France had declared war and they lost, and so they have to pay for it. The war was rather short, so it's not a huge indemnity. I put just one dollar sign here. And the reason I bring it up is that there's going to be an indemnity later on that's very famous in World War I, but it's just a common thing. This is what countries do to each other. This was a short war, so the indemnity is small. He also takes a couple of provinces. Now, he didn't really want to do this, but his princes and kings insisted that they take some French territory, and so he takes the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. This is right on the German border. So this will kind of push the Germans into French territory. It'll be basically a buffer state. It turns out that these two provinces are actually very valuable, very wealthy provinces and underground, a lot of coal and iron there in Alsace and Lorraine, plus it's on the border. So if the French come toward Germany again, they'll have to pass through Alsace and Lorraine to get into Germany. The other thing that happens here is the creation of Germany. Bismarck, in the, with all the victorious Germans around him, demand an empire as Bismarck wanted. He will help them create Germany. In 1871, Germany is created as an empire with an emperor now. The king of Prussia, William I, will become the emperor of Germany. And I want to just throw some German here. You won't be tested on German, but just want to throw you the word König out there. The word König is a German king, and a Kaiser is now a German emperor. So the king of Prussia, the König of Prussia, has become the Kaiser of Germany. Bismarck also allowed some liberal things, such as voting, and um, the Germans will demand, many liberal Germans will demand a Congress, and this is called a Reichstag. I just want to bring this word up because we're going to be moving toward Hitler later on, and the Reichstag becomes important. Um, the way Bismarck creates it, Bismarck, deeply conservative, um, sets it up so that Prussia will dominate. Nothing will happen in the Reichstag unless Prussia says it can happen, and Prussia is extremely conservative. The military now, all these German states will be united together militarily, and they'll be following Prussia. Prussian generals will now be sent to all the German states to unify the German armies together. Very potent force. Here's a picture, a famous painting of uh, the unification of Germany. Here you've got the, the new Kaiser there, all the German princes here raising their swords, and in the middle is the great hero, Bismarck. He stands out the most. He is the man of the hour. The other thing to notice in the painting is it's in the Hall of, Vers uh, the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Germany is created at France's expense. This would not be lost on anyone in the, who saw this painting that this is the demise of France and the rise of Germany. So now you've got a great German state stretching from East Prussia, which touches Russia, all the way down to Silesia, Saxony, Bavaria, all the way now, including Alsace and Lorraine here, into French territory. Now, the French are unhappy. After 1870 and 71, this was a disaster for France and they want revenge. Bismarck begins to build alliances. 
He is a master of diplomacy. He recognized that the French are extremely angry and will attack Germany at some point. And so he begins to build alliances against France. In 1872, his first unification here, will be the Three Emperors League. The three emperors near to him will be united, not on paper, but just kind of as a social gathering, a league. Germany, the Kaiser of Germany, the Emperor of Austria-Hungary, and the Tsar of Russia will meet together and mutually consult. We call this mutual consultation, mostly about France, that France was seen as the enemy of Europe, and these three emperors need to stand together. By 1879, he's ready for uh, an alliance on paper. He will actually have a paper alliance called the Dual Alliance between Germany and Austria-Hungary. These two emperor emperors will unite on paper, offensive and defensive alliance. Of course, you might notice that Russia's left out. Russia was not happy about that. The Tsar was wondering why he's being left out of this. And the Germans will tell him that, well, you know, we're closer to France, and so we really need to be more united. And the Russians are kind of different people anyway. These are Germans, and these are Russians are Slavs. Next is 1882, a triple alliance on paper. This is Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. Italy touches France, and so the Kai, uh, Bismarck wants Italy involved with this. This would threaten France from the south. But the Italians only want a defensive alliance. Only if France attacks Italy will Italy come in. So Bismarck has these alliances all gathered to isolate France. Europe gathered against France, and not hard to see France is the bad guy here. France started 1870 war, and France is screaming for revenge. So France is the bad guy at this time. And then we get the end of Bismarck. Bismarck grows old and um, will be sent out to pasture here. In 1888, Germany has a new emperor. This is Kaiser Wilhelm II. So the old Kaiser is gone. The new Kaiser is a young man, William II, Wilhelm II, whom I will call the crazy Kaiser. This is how a good, kind of a good way to mem remember his personality. William II uh, suffers from what we would call an inferiority complex. He was born with a shriveled left arm or a wrenched left arm that never grew and never he couldn't use it. And this makes him kind of feel like he's insecure or inferior and he becomes angry and violent about this. He also grows up jealous of Bismarck. Bismarck was the great hero of Germany and he will want himself to be the hero of Germany. And so as soon as he becomes emperor within months, he will release Bismarck and tell the old man to go off and write his memoirs and thank you for your service to Germany, but we'll handle it from here. And this will be a great change for the Germans because everything had been united against France. And this new Kaiser brings in some new elements here, a, a racism against Slavs. And basically Russia will be pushed away from Germany. This racism towards Slavs, every, basically everyone to the east of Germany. He also is hostile to Great Britain. Britain, of course, was the master empire of the age. Everyone discussing Britain or Britain is the policeman of the world. And he didn't like that. He felt that Eng uh, Britain's age was done. You know, France's age was done. Britain's age is done. This would be the age for Germany. Another thing he loves is ships. Now, this shouldn't be a problem. People love ships, even today. Uh, this, the airplane hasn't been invented yet, and so ships are the best thing going if you want to get around the world. The problem is that once he becomes emperor, he begins to devote lots and lots of money toward this German navy. And of course, his military people are telling him, look, France is the enemy. We need an army against France. Why are you building a navy? In fact, Britain will start to question, why are you building a navy? And he'll just say that I like ships. Okay, but then he begins to build so many that it begins to threaten Great Britain. And of course, he doesn't like Britain anyway, and now he's building a great navy. And the British take note of this. He then begins to make all kinds of public statements about Germany's place in the sun. This is his words for it. Germany is about to take its place in the sun. The age of France is gone. The age of Britain is gone. This is the age for Germany to take its place in the sun. He will now begin to grab colonies all around the world. He will send his navies to plant flags at places where no one else had been. The Spanish, uh, British, French, Dutch, Portuguese. Uh, there's not much left around, but the Germans will grab what's left. So all over Africa, wherever there's not a flag, he'll plant flags. Uh, he'll start getting involved in China, which everyone was getting involved in China. And then all through the Pacific, he'll start grabbing islands for his navy. He'll also plan a Berlin to Baghdad railroad. This is kind of impressive. A railroad from Berlin all the way down through Europe and then all the way through Istanbul and then all the way down through Mesopotamia. 
a Berlin to Baghdad railroad. This is very impressive, a great project. Um, and it brings him involvement with the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, the sick man of Europe, this poor empire, dying empire, now becomes re reinvigorated with German support. It's pretty impressive. And then he starts to build this new type of dreadnought, this new type of battleship. The British invented a dreadnought battleship, a powerful, fast, super battleship, and the Germans will steal the plans for it and begin building their own. And of course, the British were already angry about his navy in the first place, and now they become really angry that he is building dreadnought battleships to contest their dreadnought battleships. So the, this does not help him with the British. So let's look at what's happening here as we approach around 1900. The rivalry is on. Everyone knows there's going to be a war between France and Germany. It's just, it's, it's going to happen. The French are screaming for revenge. Germany's planning for wars against France. So let's look at what's happening here. On France's side, for the longest time, for, since 1870, France had no friends. They were just a screaming country, very angry. They do find a friend eventually, Russia, when the, the new Kaiser doesn't deal with the Russians anymore, the Russians begin to deal with the French. So they actually sign an alliance in 1894. Nobody thinks much of it. France and Russia have nothing in common except their hostility, possible hostility toward Germany. The third country on this side is Great Britain. And I put a question mark there because they don't sign anything. It's not an alliance with France or Russia. It's just that they tend toward this side. Sometimes they don't, though. Sometimes there's hostility toward Russia or France, but they tend to be in this camp. So we call it the Triple Entente in that they have an understanding. It's not an alliance. There's an alliance between France and Russia, but not so much with the British. The British just seem to be over there, so we call it an Entente. On the other side, we have Germany, closely tied with Austria-Hungary. This alliance will definitely last. And then Italy is in there too, but defensive only, only if Germany is attacked or if Italy is attacked. They're help counting on the Germans to come to their support. So it's on paper, but it's not an offensive necessarily alliance. We call this the Triple Alliance because they are completely allied. Once the war starts, just to confuse you, once the war starts, we'll start calling these the Central Powers, and then once the war starts, these will actually turn into allies, and so we'll call these the Allies and these the Central Powers once the war starts. But here's your situation uh, after around 1900. You've got France here and Russia, they're allied, and then the middle part of Europe, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, all allied. So you've got these two on one side and the, uh, and the triple alliance in the middle. The other thing to discuss here is a rivalry between Austria, Hungary, and Russia. Now this takes a back seat. Everyone's concerned about France and Germany. This one would take a back seat to everything. The place that they come into conflict is over the Balkans. Now, nobody seems to care too much about the Balkans, but they are there. Um, and what's happening is that the Ottoman Empire is in decline. They could die any minute. The, the Turks could just disintegrate and their empire fall apart. They're referred to as the sick man of Europe, this dying empire. In fact, in the diplomacy of the age, they refer to the Turks as the, they're going to die one day. This empire is going to fall apart. And what's going to happen when the Ottomans give up the Balkans? Well, the prize of all this is the city of Istanbul. It's important strategically. And so the Austrian-Hungarians, Austro-Hungarians want and to go into the Balkans and possibly get Istanbul. To the Russians, this is huge, that this city used to be, Ist Istanbul used to be Constantinople, which was the founder of Russian Christianity. So it's a Christian uh, capital for them. And uh, 